It's not what's fine. I changed the tape. seconds. Um, we don't know the physics of the Planck scale. We just know that something spectacular happens that's different in physics of the Planck scale. And it, it's, where, it's where quantum mechanics and relativity run into each other. If you take a quantum particle and apply its energy versus its size, the smaller it gets, the higher its energy. And uh, if you take a black hole, so the opposite is true. The smaller a black hole gets, uh, the, the smaller its mass is. And they run together at the Planck scale. Um, you can do that in time or length or, or energy. If you do it in energy units, it's 10 to the 16 TeV, so it's 16 orders of magnitude higher energy than you can reach with a particle accelerator. Um, so it seems rather inaccessible experimentally. Wait, so the, the physical significance of this just isn't known. I mean, we, what we know is that if you did extrapolate like, these physics to the Planck scale, if you can find a quantum particle with Planck volume, then it would make its own black hole and, and all the ideas fall apart. So it has seemed um, very difficult to study this, uh, except for cosmology. It's been a, a, a cosmology talks about the Planck scale, but but particle accelerators are 16 orders of magnitude short. So you, you can make particles into tiny pieces, but they're they're not small enough. You know, what, what I'm going to talk about is another idea, a different technology entirely, one that's now developed to a very high level for gravitational wave work, which is to use um, interferometers. And instead of grouping particles into tiny pieces with high energy collisions, the idea here is that with interferometers you measure collective phases of coherent light with extreme precision, actually to about the same scale as particle accelerators, the Terra scale. But you do this coherently over a very large volume of space and time. And in this way, with some idea of unification, you might actually um, sense a jitter or noise in space time that comes from a Planck frequency bound. It only occurs in some theory, so it might not be there, but it's worth checking if we can. So there's a one interpretation that I'll talk about of this Planck wave um, that produces the, this holographic noise, as we call it. And it's not the same as gravitational wave. It's a physically different thing. It's a kind of sampling error, sampling noise. It's not, it doesn't carry energy, for example. And it's also not the same as quantum fluctuations in the gravitational field, which are really on a microscopic scale. This is on a large scale. It's on a scale of an apparatus. And, and you can predict the properties of this noise um, in this particular interpretation with no parameters. So we have a definite experimental target. And really the point of this talk is to tell you about an experiment that we're um, planning and building to do this. So let, let me talk about the theory first. Um, I'll just talk about several different ways to talk about it. And um, you know, please, please find me afterwards for more. Um, the basic idea is that um, you, you, you um, have a, the minimum time is really a maximum frequency, and that there's really a bandwidth limit to space time that limits how space time can uh, correlate from one place to another. So that anything you observe actually has to be able to fit on a Planck wavelength carrier wave. And if that's true, um, and, and, and there's several ways of uh, estimating this I'll go through, then the, the transverse positions of things, if you do a me measurement with light, like a laser wave from, um, but the transverse positions of things are uncertain not by the Planck length, but by the Planck diffraction length, which is much bigger than the Planck length, which is why it might be detectable. Another way of looking at this is that the classical paths and directions in spacetime might be like the ray approximations of waves, <coughs> where the wavelength of the waves is the Planck length. But in fact, ray rays are not completely um, uniquely determined by a field of waves. There's some fuzziness to them, which is the uncertainty. 
So in, in plane mechanics, it's pretty easy to understand that. So an, an infinite plane wave corresponds to a, a perfect ray with a well-defined direction. But that is not at all localized in the transverse direction. And as soon as you do try to localize the transverse direction, you introduce some transverse momentum, which introduces an uncertainty in the orientation of the wave. And that, which is just this uncertainty that I'm talking about, if you, if you assign these waves a flight wavelength. So it, from the point of view of, of measurements with light, what that looks like is that the positions of things, like mirrors and the barometer, look like they're wandering around by about a flight length per flight time in, in a random walk. And, and, it, and over a significant macroscopic time, like a microsecond, that's, uh, that's about an atometer of wandering. And that's, that's what you can try to detect. Uh, okay, th th this kind of um, language has been used um, in, um, in before, in, uh, in by 50 years ago, by, by big nerd people, um, not to talk about the transverse positions, but to talk about the, uh, the, the radial positions, to talk about the, uh, the uh, re reconciling quantum mechanical limits with the measurement of space time. Um, and, and really all we're doing here is adding a second space-like dimension to, to big nerd. Right? They talked about measuring space-like separation between events using light signals. Um, and if you do that with uh, band-limited signals, something that doesn't have anything above a certain frequency, like, like line frequency, then there's an ambiguity in the transverse positions in, a, in, a, in the wavefront, in the yeah, kind of way, um, which is much bigger because um, uh, the, uh, the, the phase of the wave doesn't change over very much over the transverse distance, which is the geometric mean of the wavelength and the separation. So, so there, there might be a fundamental limit like this. Here's another way of looking at it in terms of wave packets. So if, if you um, say you want to localize, uh, well, so lo localize an event, like a reflection of a laser on a mirror, um, that can be described by a wave packet. The wave packet has a certain delta x to it. Um, and it has a certain uh, delta frequency to it. Um, they're just related uh, by usual Fourier relationships. Um, but if you have a maximum frequency or a minimum wavelength for this wave packet, and you, and you let it travel over macroscopic separation L, then, um, then you, you again get the same diffractive relationship between the, the width of the wave packet, the minimum width of the wave packet is given by the geometric mean of the, the size of the system and the, and the inverse frequency, the maximum frequency. Um, so uh, I guess it, it, this is just the same argument in different words, but it, 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 it shows you that it's the, the same uh, this, is, this, is, this is an estimate of the standard quantum limit for an interferometer. So this is just an interferometer literature. Assuming that you made an interferometer with flight wave length lasers, if you could do that, this is, this is the limit of that, to, to, to measure distances. You cannot measure in an interferometer differences in half length over large length flank precision, even with a flank wave length laser, and because, because of laser uh, vacuum action. Uh, so actually, the, the way I like to talk about this most now is in terms of, uh, of clocks. Um, so um, one of the ways that people talk about the plank limit in fundamental theory is by introducing non-commutative geometry. You introduce a, a, a term, um, instead of having normal positions that commute, um, if you introduce a, a, a planking commutator, so if you measure the uh, position in one direction, you measure the position in another direction, and then you reverse those operations, they don't commute. There's, you get a plank scale commutator. And uh, physically, a way to interpret that is that if you have a clock, um, clocks have orientations. You have a clock in uh, one direction and a clock in another, another direction, and you time their ticks, say with uh, propagating laser wavefronts or something like that, that the, the, the ticks are perfectly aligned with each other. They drift apart with a plank in random walk. And, and this, is a kind of, this is actually sort of what you do in your barometer. You have, you have one arm and another arm. Um, the light goes out in two directions, and you synchronize the phases, send them out, and come back, and you find that the, the wavefronts have decohered by the amount of like random walk travels in that time. So, so this is uh, 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 one interpretation of, of non commutative geometry. So, the, the surprising thing is that um, if, if, if you only want to measure time over a very small time interval, like a microsecond, this is shorter than most people need any time for. But if that's all you want to do, and all you want to do is to, to compare time in two different directions, an interferometer is really the best way to do that. It's much more precise than any atomic clock. So you, in, in, in clock language, you can talk about the differential frequency between two directions and how much it drifts over time. And it's given, this, it's given by um, 
if, if, you, if you have a, a Planck frequency limit or Planck in random walk, um, you get this kind of number for that grid, for the delta frequency or frequency of delta time over time. After, say, a second, this is the fractional difference in the rate of the clocks. And, and this is what you can actually reach with interferometer technology, as I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, whereas, the, whereas the best atomic clocks are, are of many orders of magnitude worse than that. Of course, atomic clocks can go much longer. They can go over 10,000 seconds. It's not more than a microsecond. And then that's just differential. But, but that, that shows why this technology is actually, you can see something that you wouldn't have been able to see any other way. So, um, and I, I, I won't go through the, the, the details of this to show. Um, if, if, if you are a aficionado of, uh, of lasers, um, this equation would be familiar to you. So perhaps it may be that you can describe noise and cavity. But you can also describe that, uh, you can derive it from the, the, the same matrix operators that people use in, in matrix theory. Fundamental matrix theory, except for the, for the Planck and fundamental radial. It, it, it just shows that you have a, a, a way to discuss uh, all what I've been talking about in terms of the sort of conventional wave optics theory. The, the, and in that, in that language, um, the, 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 the modes, the like cavity modes, where the, there's a the transverse and a longitudinal wave number. And uh, this is more or less the same effect I've been talking about. You can have a, as you, as you um, go, if you go to very small, if you go to planking scales, the universe actually looks um, two dimensional and, and it starts to grow a third dimension on macroscopic scale. And you, modes look more and more rain-like because even though the, the transverse direction grows with time, it only grows to the square root of time. So it stretches out to be thinner and thinner. It's more and more like a ray as time goes on. So all of those ideas are, are kind of, kind of a, all different versions of wave physics um, transposed to the, the Planck scale. Uh, the, the, the main thing to notice is that as you go to large separations, L, the uncertainties and angles get smaller. And the things, things become more classical, more <coughs> ray-like. And the, the classical world works better and better. Um, but if you talk about transverse positions, that, the actual um, uncertainty in, in, in the positions of things, that actually grows with scale, all the other things square root of scale. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so Craig, there, there are lots of formulas here, but I'm going to ask you, I mean, it's hard to come out of the way to each other. Let me ask you a basic question. Yeah. Many of your formulas break the rest of the Yeah, th this does break the rest of the Okay, so there are already good tests at the front scale of breaking the rest of the like the absence of like 10 years. Yeah. The propagation of radio waves way beyond the front scale. Well, this, this kind of violation. Like the, like the propagation, this would not have been seen. It, it doesn't show up in a propagation speed test, for example, since it's only it's purely transverse. <laughs> Your hypothesis is that there is a preferred rest frame in the rest of the If you want to take the, the hypothesis like a non commutative challenge, put it in a non Planckian commutator, right? and, and with a particular interpretation. And that does violate the rest of the but, but I don't think it would have been detected in any other There are versions of non commutative geometry that break the rest So, if you want to think about it this way, 
the experiment I'm going to talk about will set a limit, um, plank, a Planckian limit on a parameter of non trivial geometry. And an interpretation of it. Where the interpretation is that the positions are, the positions in the, in the commutator are measured by phases of null fields. Because that's what we measure. We measure the phases of null fields. So with that, I mean, so you have the theoretical formalism that lets you calculate how an upper is. So I'm not going to. So this is just a summary of all that you could, You know, there's a theory, the theoretical arguments that you can look about. There's ways to calculate the work. I, I actually uh, agree with you guys that this, none of these arguments are conclusive. We just we want to do an experiment to see whether this is happening or not. And, and, and the experimental uh, apparatus was uh, invented um, in, in the 19th century by Alan Michelson. Um, the, the principle of it uh, is just the same as he used. So you, you, you have a you have a, a, a the beam splitting mirror, you have a source of light, and the light is uh, set, half of it is set down one arm, the other is set down another arm, and there are mirrors at the ends that send the light back. This one then reflects a second time. It goes through the first time, it reflects a second time. And then the, the beams are combined and the, the, uh, the intensity of the sun is measured. It tells you the phase of the, uh, the difference of the length of the two arms. So there are two reflections off of the beam splitter, or at times they're separated by the light travel. So, as, as we all know, this, this is I mean, this is actual. This is Albert's um, Albert Michelson's uh, detector. He actually did use his ion detector. Um, and as we all know, uh, this was the first and it's still the finest probes based on. So this is a Michelson model's apparatus that he used to. You know, like, there's an ether. He rotates tables. We all like the same whatever direction we're in. And, 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 and like, like today, they had to use all kinds of tricks with mirrors um, to multiply the sensitivity of the effect. Like in the path length. Um, I like this picture because it, uh, this is Michelson later in his career. So this is all the way, this is 1924. And they're, they're out there in the snow, the airport is now Midway Airport. And this is, this is, a, this is a Michelson air barometer that actually is 1,000 feet by 2,000 feet in size. It's a sort of lighter scale. And, and they, these are water pipes that they pumped out. This is the first vacuum system to use for their barometer. And they still use they use arc lamps for their source, and they use eyeballs for detection. And they were able to detect the rotation of the Earth. Amazing. Seventeen thousand dollars from the University of Chicago. For this experiment. <laughs> so <laughs> they didn't see either. They saw the rotation of the Earth from it was a Mach Zender configuration. So they were able to see the difference in phase between the two directions of the cavity. Yeah. Okay, so these days we use lasers and photodiodes, so it's it's better. Um, and now, how much better? Well, you know, they now get down to atomometer, atomometer precision. So, in in, in the, the spectral units, they measure positions with a spectra, spectral density ten to the minus eighteen. That's an atomometer per root hertz. It's actually, is about an atomometer of difference in position of the beam splitter mirror between the first and second reflections. And they do that over kilometer scales. This is the uh, looking down the tube of the GS600 beam to that's the beam splitter at the end. This is the, the, the objects that we use to reflect. You can see, you can't even see the thin glass threads that are hanging there. Very sophisticated technology to reach that level. And that's what it looks like on the outside. This is GS600 in the trench outside of the cornfield in Germany. It's just a shallow trench of the beam tube. Of course, the, the, the kind of star of this is LIGO, the kind of flagship uh, Hanford and Livingston. And all of those machines are uh, designed and optimized for looking for gravitational waves, which forces them to relatively low frequencies, up to a kilohertz, which is actually much lower than the native frequency of the universal object. So the, the, these, these you know, the LIGO infrared actually bounce the beam back and forth about 100 times as, in order to increase the gravitational wave sensitivity because of usually uh, the, the, the native frequency. <laughs> so um, I guess I, I won't go into the details, but just to say, you know, it's it's like Michael said, an interferometer, the, the interferometer for, for LIGO. Uh, they uh, they beef it up, they, they put in extra mirrors to recycle power, increase the amount of laser light in the cavity. That's in order to reduce the photon shot rate. And they also have these, these extra mirrors that I mentioned to um, store even more light in the cavity separately. But the basic idea is the same. Hypersensitive 
detection fail, since you produce time in the same. I, I, this is actually relevant to my talk, but I just always have to put it in the fuck thing to see. <laughs> I don't think I should bother anymore to the details since my reporting to the reviewers, but anyway, um, Lisa will not detect holographic modes because there are so many gravitational waves of low frequencies you can't see holographic modes. It'll be flooded with gravitational waves. As, as within 30 seconds of launching. So, anyway, it's because it's a low frequency machine that goes into space and it's five, five million kilometers. So that's, that's what I want to ask. If you want to ask me more later, that's fine. So, so what about, so back to the holographic noise idea. So the idea that you have a tiny generator positions transverse to null wave points. And, and, and that, that's going to, we're going to try to detect that with the right parameter. So the principle of that in the parameter is that you extend a wave front in. It reflects off the beam splitter. One, well, one of the, half the beam, um, half the stain reflects off the beam splitter and goes down this arm. The other half goes right through. And then a microsecond or so later it comes back. This one reflects. This one goes straight through and then you find the pairs. Between those two times, as a microsecond or so has elapsed, um, the, this, the beam splitter is wandered by about a half a or so. And that gives you a little bit smaller range of jitter, a little bit of a random block, which introduces noise in the output. So you can go through the, the wave optics of this, and you can use a black hole entropy to normalize the wave length. So you actually have a prediction of how many parameters are. Um, it, it, order magnitude, the, the effect of spectral density, this is for gravitational waves, it's just given by the square root of the Planck So it's just a number, um, 2.3 times 7 minus 22 for the Hertz in the type of spectral density. And you can compare that with gravitational wave detectors. So here's the spectral density, the same units plotted for GO600. This is amplitude spectral density. Here's 10 to the minus 22. Again, these are low frequencies. This is 100. This is kilohertz. And this is the noise budget in GO600, and it's, it's obviously the mess. It's all this. I mean, I mean, the whole art of this is to get rid of all the noise you can to detect gravitational wave. And, and these are all the sources of the noise they add up to this. And they actually observe this black group, which is a little bit more than what they can account for. If, 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 you, if you put the holographic prediction on this plot with the picture here, factor 2 pi, it comes out there. So it wouldn't have been seen yet, maybe, or it might be contributing maybe up to 30% of the noise at the minimum. But they are in the game. They have a, this technology appears capable of detecting this effect, of detecting a blank case. Okay. And I, I won't go through the detail, but LIGO, actually, even though LIGO is more sensitive to gravitational waves, it's not as sensitive to polar waves. This is actually the best instrument for polar waves because of the way it's laid out. So the current situation is that you know, interferometers, this kind of interferometer is the best technology we have for detecting their effect. And the most sensitive machine is operating close to plant sensitivity. They actually have noise they can't explain. Um, most of what I should, the mystery noise has now been explained at the low frequencies. It's the usual fundamental stuff we're always trying to get rid of. But they still, they, they can't actually give you a definitive limit or detection to this, etc. They've never, they've never published results on this because of that. They actually, the machine's not designed for doing this find this kind of thing. Um, so if we, want to, if we want to get evidence one way or the other, we want to build an apparatus to do that. And that's, and that's the machine we want to build at Fermilab, which we're calling a holographic interferometer, or holometer for short. And a holometer actually is a word with a definition in the English dictionary. In the, in the 17th century, it meant a mathematical instrument for the easy measure of anything whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy, but it is it is relatively inexpensive. <laughs> so anyway, so the, I, yeah, I want, I want to go through the this is this is kind of a pitch for review panels. The, the basic the basic idea is that you um, build standard minus standard parameter, and you build two of them, and you correlate their outputs. And, and if you if you put them, this, so this is a space time diagram. This is the beam splitter of the two, and these are the two arms. This is space. This is time. If you put them next to each other, then they're probing the same volume of space time. The graphic jitter should be the same in both of them. That will show the outputs in the far label, just as if it were a gravitational wave. Although it can't be a gravitational wave because the amplitude is much higher than any gravitational wave at these frequencies. If you separate them, the correlation disappears. So if you have a diagnostic, or if you rotate the correlation disappears. So, so that's really the key thing. And the other part of this is that 
we can we can do all of this at very high frequencies, megahertz instead of kilohertz, where um, there are no gravitational waves. So, but also there's no environmental noise except for <coughs> so all of the usual things of the which is expended are struggling with are not a problem for this experiment. So it's it's much easier to achieve and smaller, you know, uh, sort of a forty a forty meter scale. So so the the basic idea is that you you build one of these here again it's a space time diagram that you really use for the you, you, you measure the correlation when they're next to each other, these are the causal diamonds. And then you, you, you can you know, move, move them apart. And as you move them apart, the signal, the correlated part of the signal disappears. The correlated part is the same. Then when, they're, when, they're, when, they're, when, they're, when the web is no longer overlapped, there's no longer a correlation. So this is something like what it will look like. You'll have two things that you can actually do So there's two sim very simple optical assemblies. <coughs> Uh, again, I won't go through the, the optimization in detail, but just to say, this is what the reason for the choice of 40 meters and so is governed by what you can do with all the shelf parts. Standard <coughs> meters, standard volumes. So the main, I wanted to show this because what this shows is, is this is the this is the predicted um, correlation cross correlation function between two interferometers. You know, this is <coughs> notice this formula. I mean, the, the only there isn't any parameter formula. This is the length of the system. And this is the plane time. So this function is just, we just, that's what we're looking for, this particular cross correlation. <laughs> and the dominant noise in the system is the correlated shot noise after a few hours. So we should be able to measure that <coughs> in the experiment. We should be able to see the plane and noise. And then if you separate them, this, this, this shows a um, <coughs> correlation. If you, if you separate them, then the, the correlation starts going away. So that's what we're looking for. Um, again, I, I guess I don't need to show you uh, the details of uh, optical design, but this is just, so that's the optical design, and this is what it actually looks like on an optical bench in a small version. So you know, it's not it's not a fancy design; it's a simple design. It's a standard quality design. It's not a parameter. And again, standards are uh, off-shelf parts for correlating everything. These are people in the Premier Lab putting together. Breadboard for it. I, I just wanted to show this because I thought this was a really cool thing. This is so. This is we ordered this last week. Right, so for sixty thousand dollars, we ordered for a new stainless steel vacuum system. So, awesome. so, so this is going into a, <laughs> a tunnel of Fermi Lab this summer. This is just a prototype. We won't have all of them. So. so working on this, we have we have a, a team of crack physicists at the lab. We also have in red here very important. Um, experts from LIGO, including Greg Weiss, who's the, the, the godfather of the conceptual design, and Sam <coughs> Walton, Stan McKinley, the best of So um, that's, they, they're the reason why I have some confidence in the thing I actually did. Um, and, 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 and Steve Meyer at the University of Chicago is um, doing electronics, and now all these people are putting together this uh, prototype cavity. Um, we, we will either find the results we want. Um, and if we don't, which is probably quite likely, um, uh, all I can say is that um, we'll constrain some interpretations of the law. It means that there, there, there's no plank frequency bound. There's no, the non-unit geometry doesn't affect the impact of positions in the way that I described. That's really right. And um, so we'll move on. Uh, on the other hand, if we do see it, then we have an experiment that probes high scale unification, and we're studying, uh, what, we actually have an experimental guide to plank theory. You know, some, something will help us with the mass all our right, so um, that's really all I wanted to say about physics. I, 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 do, I do want to say a few words about Dick because um, the, um, Dick is, is one of the, the deepest thinkers I know. <laughs> <laughs> we spent many happy hours linking together the hundred mysteries of the universe um, and coming overseas. And, and I also, I, I know that Art brought this up earlier, but um, anyway, there, there, there's more than one resemblance between um, Dick and, and um, Willie Fowler. Um, you know the the the, 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 the style the style of science the style of science the style of, 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 of how we this this thing is so <coughs> really well, must have made it to the film so it's a really type of thing um, and, and the other the other thing that I you know, the kind of the parallels with here's, here's Dick and his um you know when Dick goes to Europe it's like James Bond and he hangs out with beautiful classy women and <laughs> 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 places like that and it's not that's Dick to Europe right. And again, you know, the same deal with Willie. Right? <laughs> 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 so, 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 I'm quickly going to take a problem sitting at a, at, a, at a table of the Queen of Sweden some days. Anyway, 
Um, I, I, I just wanted to finish with, because um, I don't have a, um, I, I think most people here don't know the German drinking song that you all know at Tokyofest. But we haven't sung Happy Birthday yet. And this is Dick's birthday. We have a large male chorus, including many Russians. <laughs> Can we do that now? I mean, okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Those predictions were made for um, 
metrical perturbations. They were, they were, they're basically like. It doesn't matter what the theory is. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. No, because well, the geometry. Why no, because it's a different geometry. So, so it's strain perturbation is not the same as shear perturbation. Blank was more sensitive to strain perturbations. It's actually less sensitive to displacement was it used. So, and, and the reason is that if you have a strain perturbation, then um, in, in those separate arms, the phase displacement accumulates in the many bounds back and forth in the arms at low frequency. So in terms of if you, if you did the same calculation for my prediction for LIGO, it would be an extra numerical factor for that, and it would be a hundred times lower. It's good because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a purely transverse effect, and the effective motion is purely shear, as no, uh, no component in the real direction which the phase is complicated. So, so the effect is enhanced in GEO 600? GEO 600 is seeing the whole effect in LIGO, suppressing it in LIGO's units, is the way to say it. Because they're quoting they're quoting effective gravitational wave response. But if, so if, 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 if you go into the displacement, it's like meters per meter. <laughs> the LIGO actually would see meters, the same meters per meter as the GS600, but the gravitational wave is smaller. Do you have a drawing of something like that? Yeah, well, okay. yeah, the, um, yeah. Right, so in, this, in LIGO, the difference is that GS600 doesn't have these numbers. So, so the gravitational wave is going through the system in LIGO, then um, it, it, it takes um, sort of a um, hundred oscillation bounces for the gravitational wave to go by. And while that's happening, there's a coherent um, addition to a phase difference between the two. And you take those mirrors out of the structure, and, and the experiment we're doing, um, if you're measuring the phase difference in one like that area every time. So it's a maker. So, so it's actually, it's looking for a different, and it, I mean, there are other different things. LIGO actually did another experiment, which is to correlate uh, the, the two pan-perturbator barometers, or two pieces of the two pan-perturbator barometers, and they also did the same thing. But if you, again, if you go through the geometry of it, they wouldn't have seen it. Okay. Another question? Okay, that's not